I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Flavio from Red Hat, um, who some of you may um, remember from last year. Um, he also presented our an Ansible tutorial yesterday, um, uh, which was pretty much fully booked. And yeah, um, he's going to be speaking to us with about um, not trying to look smart, but instead trying to be smart. Um, and without further ado, over to Flavio. Thank you. Good morning. Jesus Christ. I didn't want to do this, but now you all please um, stand up. <laughs> I was going to skip this live. I'm already excited I made it, actually. I managed to leave my home and, and forget my shoes at home. So I had to go back, get the shoes, get on the train. We got stuck on the train for like 40 minutes. And I was freaking out, I was texting JP like every second, like I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be there, I'm not going to make it in time. Um, I tried to get off of the train, but the doors were locked, and so we couldn't do that. We had to wait until the train actually moved and got to the next station. And when we managed to get off of the train and get an Uber and come here, uh, I haven't had coffee, so this is going to be really fun. Uh, so let's shake our hands a little bit, let's wake up, let's clap. I know you like clapping. Awesome. Well, now that I've tricked you into give me, giving me understanding ovation, which is awesome, um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to do like a quick ex exercise with all of you. Um, just imagine, I'm not going to go Deepak Chopra on you, uh, but just imagine for a second, uh, what is JP just laughing his eyes off? Uh, just imagine for a second what would happen if you had the chance to start your career all over again. If you had a chance to um, do all the things that you've done and imagine what you would change. And specifically, I want you to imagine that you don't have all the time that you've had so far. You have way less time that you had so far. Imagine what you would do and what you would change. I'll give you just like a couple of seconds to go through that. Not the entire talk because this is my talk and I want to talk. I'm Italian. All right, now you can sit if you want, or you can just um, stand if that makes you feel more comfortable uh, for some reason. I'm Flavio, or Flapper87 in this thing that I believe is going to be really successful called Twitter. Um, if you want to follow my ramblings, um, that, is, that is where you can do that. Um, I, love, I love the dopamine hits every time someone follows me, so please do it. Um, and I, I love feedback, uh, so if you, if, you, if you have any feedback for me uh, from this uh, presentation, by all means, tweet me. If you don't like the presentation, that is not my Twitter handle. <laughs> and, and, um, and yeah, like, someone has to feed my ego, and that's you, so just go and follow me. I'm not going to say that again. Um, that is me in some other conference at some other time. Um, I normally don't care if you interrupt me. I actually, if you, if you, if you want to, say something and you have any question, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm not sure if there's going to be questions in this talk, more like the comments. If you want to comment on something, I'll, I won't mind either. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here again. I thoroughly enjoyed my time here last year and I was so looking forward to be here again. And it is so awesome that I got this opportunity again. Um, that is my email address in case you hate Twitter, um, like most of us do, but still use it. But if you prefer emailing me, uh, feel free to do it. So this is a very cheesy title, actually. I'm terrible at coming up with names for my talks. And that's probably the reason I've never, ever spoken at PyCon US, because I don't know, the entry level is pretty high. And I think they read a lot um, the titles. And titles are important, but I'm terrible. So if you read the abstract, the abstract says a lot about this uh, talk. and. Um, I really hope I'm going to meet all your expectations. And if I'm not, I'm sorry. I've got nothing for you. Um, and well, you'll probably waste a, an hour listening to me talking. A um, couple of disclaimers, and I swear I'm going to get to my content. Um, I tend to speak really fast. This presentation is actually a little, bit, a little bit harder for me than all the previous that I've done. And it is because I'm going to share some things about my past and, the, and my career and the stuff that I've learned. 
And the things I'm going to share are going to make me look like an idiot. But I think that's actually perfect because that is the point for my presentation. I don't pretend to look smart uh, behind you. I want to be very honest with you. And, and I hope you can learn something from my previous experiences and the things that I've learned to my, uh, in my career. And I love dropping F-bombs, so I'm sorry in advance. And, and this being a personal topic, it's going to very likely end up with me dropping F-bombs everywhere. So, again, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to uh, break the code of conduct or anything. Um. All right. So, this is a summary of my career. Spoiler alert, there are some things here that you probably don't know. Um, this is the TLDR. I found the internet. Tons of shit happened in between. Eventually, I figured out that Luke is Darth Vader's uh, son, which was uh, um, surprising for me. And then tons of shit happened in between as well. And then I started coding a lot. Like I coded like crazy. Like I would spend hours and hours and nights, and I wouldn't mind whether I had, uh, I had been getting enough sleep or not, or or whether I was paying enough attention to my family or whatever. I just coded like crazy because I loved it. That was my passion. Then tons of shit happened in between again. Um, shit happens in between things. Um, and then too many Batman movies came out. And guess what happened after? Everyone. Well, you're wrong. They decided to create a fucking movie with Batman fighting with Superman, which are my best superheroes ever. How is that even possible? And now I just eat bananas because my life has no sense ever. Um, and it's like they ruined my life. Uh, anyway, now the longer version, which is probably the one that you actually want to hear about, it starts here. I owe a lot to the internet. I owe a shit ton of things to the internet. Because that's where I actually uh, learned to program. That's, that's where I became an engineer. Um, I, I started Googling stuff. I figured out how to Google shit, and that was awesome because then I Googled everything, and I joined RC channels, and I uh, read blogs, and I you know, just, just Googled like crazy and started reading and reading and reading and reading and reading, and I learned a lot. I started coding, participating in communities. I even Googled my wife, actually, which she's sitting, she's sitting right here. And the thing is that we are actually high school friends, and end up like we lost contact, and then I Googled her, and then we found each other again, and the rest is history, but I even Googled my wife. Um, so that's how much I use Google in my daily basis. So I owe the internet a lot. I even owe the internet the hate I have for the internet. I really hate the internet. I hate the fact that it is so freaking addictive. And I love it, but I hate it at the same time because I, I spend too much time on it. And I've got friends that are you know, completely addicted to it and they don't really realize it and they spend too much time on it and we don't get to spend a lot of time together anymore. But that is not really uh, the internet's fault. That is our fault, because we're humans, and, and we make our choices. We decide to do that. We decide not to pay enough attention to, um, to the things we do, and the time that we spend on the internet, and, 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 and how much time we spend offline, which would be ideal in many cases. But that's not the real important thing here. So I'm a, I'm a self-taught engineer. Um, not a snowflake, really. Um, there are many self-taught engineers uh, around the world nowadays. But I did think it was awesome when I when I started coding. I was like, well, you know, this is this is something cool. You know, there's there's people going to college, and I'm like just googling the shit out of it, and it's like uh, I just figured it out. Um, you know, jackpot. And and I was very self-confident, or I would say arrogant, probably, until I interviewed with Google. And they asked me what the O notation is, and I was I had no fucking clue. And I was like blank, so it's silence in the call. And the dude was like, "Dude, it's like big O. What's that?" Just answered, and I was like, "Uh, can I Google it?" Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this was many years ago, and that was my first hit. That's when I I actually realized that sure, I had figured out a way for me to learn things, but I didn't know everything, and. And well, you know, that was a, a, a big of like a hit of humility that um, I got and, and, and I learned from that. But what I'm really are, and, and this is something that I, um, 
I care a lot is that I'm a self-taught um, worker or professional, whatever you want to call it. And there's a thing that I've, I've, I've figured out a way for me to interact with other humans in, in the internet or in my co-working spaces or my colleagues in a way that is, um, that is not selfish and it's very giving and in a way that we can all grow together and in a way that I can grow, that I can learn, and that I can progress in my career and make sure that I um, stay motivated with the things that I'm doing. I, I have a very, a probably not so conventional way of learning and it is that I like learning the hard way. So I did karate for 11 years and the way that I used to learn was if you want me to learn how to defend myself, just break my nose and that's how I'm going to learn. You'll do it once and the second time it's not going to happen for sure. So that's how I like to learn. I like to learn the hard way. Um, uh, probably masochisms, I don't know, but I, I, I just like it. It, it works for me. <laughs> and, and it's um, doing this has has had very good and bad experiences in my career, of course. Like I, I learned from from the good things that have happened, and and of course the bad things that have happened as well. And especially from the bad things, I I pay very close attention attention to all the bad things, bad air quote things that happen in my career or that happen on a daily basis, because those are, those are the ones that if you sit still and you look at them from outside. Those are the ones that will teach you the most and the ones that you'll uh, get um, more information out of. Um, well, as soon as I started using the internet, I, I figured out that it's a black hole uh, of time, which you probably know, so no secret there. But uh, the thing is that I spent so much time on it. And the problem is not really that um, it, is, it is a black hole of time, is, is, is the problem is with the value that we give to, to our time, really. So I'm not going to spend the entire talk about, uh, talking about the internet. Um, I promise this is the last slide I have talking about the internet. But um, I, I do want to make a point here, and it is internet is awesome. Just make sure that you choose what's right for your time and, and that you can make the best use of it. And, and that actually taught me that time is my most valuable currency. And the reason the time is, most valuable, uh, is the most valuable currency I have, and I believe it is the most valuable currency that we all have, is because the time value is the same for everyone. It is not like any other currency which has a different value and you can buy more of one by using others. We all have the same amount of time. We might give time the different, a different value depending on our perspective and our um, taste, but it is the same for everyone. It passes for everyone. And, and the things that we spend our time on are, are the ones that we're going to be, that are going to teach us something. And, and if, if we don't make uh, the right calls there, we're going to be, you know, wasting time. So I, I, don't really, I, I don't really get mad very often, but I do get really, really mad when people waste my time. And, and then I start waving my hands because I'm Italian, and um, that's, that's how I insult people. Um, so you, the thing is that I guess like, the critical point here is that you'll never get, like the time, once the time has passed, you're never going to get it back. Like you're not going to get back this hour that you're spending here, so I'm sorry for you. Uh, if you're not learning anything, it's like again, like I've got nothing. <laughs> but making the right call and, and making, like I, I, one of the things that actually taught me this was also going to too many conferences. Um, I travel a lot, I love conferences, I love attending as many conferences as I can. But it turns out that not all the conferences are worth my time. And I don't mean this in a very arrogant way, I mean it in a very um, humble way, if that's possible. And it is that if I, if I feel like I don't, I'm not going to give anything back to the conference and I'm not going to get anything back from the conference, then it's probably better for me to invest that time in something else that is going to be more useful. So there's no point for me to just like make a presence for the sake of people knowing that I'm there. Uh, which, is, which sometimes is good, but not all the time. Um, so, being so critical with the time and, and, and analytical, I guess, and trying to figure out how to spend my time the best way as possible, um, taught me that you cannot have a, an, an impact on things if you don't really care about the things that you're doing, if you don't care enough about them. So, here's the thing, I'm a millennial. Um, I was born in the 80s, 
And, and being a millennial makes me someone that wants to have an impact on everything. If I don't have an impact on something, I'm like demotivated. Uh, six, six months in a new job and not had and I've not had an impact on something, I'll, I'll just go nuts. And this is something for some reason that uh, we boring millennials do. And, um, and I've learned that. And since having an impact on things is important to me, I also had to decide that the things that I want to spend my time on are the things that I actually care about. Because I cannot have an impact on something that I don't really care about. So this is the thing that I, uh, this is the point in my life where I started like coding like crazy. And, and I coded and coded and coded. It, doesn't, it didn't matter to me, like PHP, I'll do it. Java, sure, why not? C Sharp, yeah. Perl, oh no, don't know. But uh, I was like, <laughs> oh, I've got some principles, come on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll do, I'll do anything. Uh, I just wanted to code on whatever. I, wanna have, I wanted to have an impact on some project, on some open source project, specifically or especially because I, I, I learned coding with open source projects. So thank you all for doing open source. Uh, you teach people like me how to be engineers. Um, but as, as I started doing this and more and more and more, I started well, analyzing exactly what I was after. And what I was really after was not really having an impact on the project. I just wanted people to know me. I just wanted people to know that I was there, to know that I was coding, to know that I was um, a smart guy, um, or at least I looked like a smart guy. And, and I wanted people to just like, you know, provide rewards to me and, and tell me, you know, how good and, and how much an impact I was having on the things that I was um, working on. And, and as I was signing up for more and more and more and more projects, I suddenly became completely overwhelmed by the entire things that I was doing, by the set of things that I was doing. It was too much for me. So that uh, taught me, actually, that uh, having too many options and, and, and being you know, like open to so many different things and being able to jump onto so many different projects is actually demotivating. Um, some people say, like it is awesome that you work on a company where you can do whatever you want and then you can you know work on as many different projects as you can work on and uh, well it turns out that if you're not careful that is really demotivating because then you end up not knowing exactly what you want to spend your time on and you might end up just signing up for way too many things which is very stressful then you don't have time then you overcommit, and then you under deliver and under delivering is freaking awful Awful, I mean, not awesome. It would be awesome uh, in some cases, but it's actually awful. It is awful because it is very demotivating. Like, you're like, you can't do anything. Like, I, I'm, I'm really trying to have an impact on this thing, and turns out I don't have enough time for it. And, and as much as I want to, well, I, have, I also have to pay attention to these other things. So, the overwhelm when you get to, uh, you know, when you uh, signed up for the, uh, to the internet for the first time and you see, you know, how big it is and all the things that you can do in it uh, can be really demotivating and depressing at some points. So that actually taught me that I shouldn't be working for fame. And this is not, I didn't come up with this pro tip, like you can Google it, I actually Google it a um, long time ago. Uh, but it took, me, it took me a long time to actually figure this out. You can't just, um, code on projects just because you want to be famous. That, that's not going to work. And I don't mean this in a way that if you work on the right projects, you'll be famous at some point. No. If you're doing it for the fame, if you're expecting to be famous at some point in your life, you're doing it wrong. I'm sorry. You got to work on the things that you actually care about. It doesn't matter if you end up being like super famous with a shit ton of like followers on Twitter or not. The important thing here is that you got to work on the things that you really, really care about. If you don't care about something, just don't do it. Don't do it because you're gonna harm yourself. You're gonna waste your own time. You're gonna waste other people's time because you might not put enough attention on the stuff that you're doing, and and that's not really um, going to teach you anything. You're not really gonna grow a lot um, in in those uh, scenarios. So, if you're working on a library that you think you're, it's useful and you're not being super rewarded. Uh, for working on that library and you're not super famous but you still think it is useful because you're using it and, and a couple of people are using it, well just keep doing it, it doesn't matter, like it, it is an useful thing. 
if what you're after is is just people to come over you and say like, dude, you're great, or, you know, you're amazing, this library is awesome. Well, it's awesome when people do that, but that's not the point behind your work, or that shouldn't be, at least in my opinion. And that taught me that dopamine is awesome. I love it. Um, so dopamine is a is a neurotransmitter. It controls the rewards and 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 pleasure. And um, I'm not a psychologist, um, in case you didn't notice that. Uh, <laughs> but I surely know when I get a dopamine hit. So dopamine hit is it's, it's that your body releases it and makes you feel so awesome and so excited like uh, when someone replies to your tweets when you have a new follower or when you know like someone faps your tweet and when someone comes to you and say like you did an awesome job you know when you reach your goals when you have performance checks and you get a bonus for that there is a dopamine hit back there and and it's great i love it but the problem with that is that is it is highly addictive and it's highly addictively so addictive that it can just make you do the things for the you know wrong motive. You know, I I I'll just go to conferences so I can meet people and get new followers. That is wrong. Like you shouldn't be doing that. Dopamine doesn't doesn't work that way. And but the feeling is awesome. So I repeat, like you know what I'm talking about uh, because we all get it. But it can be really dangerous. So. <clears throat> When when you when you're addicted to dopamine, you're you're obsessed to to um, to hitting the numbers again. You're obsessed to to having more followers on Twitter. You're obsessed to uh, to just hit the numbers, have more stars on GitHub, you know, f have more forks of your project. You're not really focused on the on the important thing, which is you know making a successful project, making something awesome out of the time that you're investing on something. Um, so let me put it this way. If, you're, if you worry more about the number of followers that you have on Twitter than the number of people that you're following, you're doing it wrong. Because the people that you're following are those that will actually teach you something. Those are the ones that you're gonna get something because those are the ones that are gonna show up on your timeline. The people that are following you, they don't show up on your timeline, right? They're just people that are reading the shit that you say on Twitter, which may or may not be interesting, that is not my problem. But if you are so obsessed with the people that follows you on Twitter and not really the people that you follow, you're doing it wrong. You're just obsessed with the dopamine hits that you get every time someone follows you and someone likes your tweets. Just keep that in mind. Fun fact about this slide, actually, is that when I was working on this slide, uh, no one followed me on Twitter, but uh, someone pinged me on IRC, and this person, I've, I've worked with this person um, on and off uh, for the last five years. And he's a, he's a Chinese friend of mine, and he now lives in New Zealand. And, and he's, he's trying to um, jump onto a new challenge for him, and he was asking for advice. So I was talking to him, and he said, um, after, after we talked for a while, he said, well, uh, now that I have you here, I would like to thank you for all the things that you've taught me in the last five years. And um, I really, I've really enjoyed these five years working with you. And, and thanks a lot for the time that you're dedicating. Uh, it's been awesome. And that was a massive dopamine hit. I was like, yes. Went to my deck, deleted the slide, and said, fuck it. I'm not going to talk about dopamine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the effect just like, faded away eventually. So I just came back to my slides and put it in. I uh, came back to reason, I guess. Um, Enough about dopamine. Caring is more important than being cool. We live in a cool area. And by cool, I mean that people are more worried about being cool than actually doing something interesting. And like, again, like we, 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 like, we like our dopamine hits. We like people following the stuff that we do. But it turns out that caring is actually more important than being cool. Sometimes it is better for you to work on the boring projects than actually working on the things that are gonna make you look cool because the boring projects sometimes have, um, have more value to other people than the things that actually make you look cool. And I'm not saying, I've, I've, not, I've got nothing against the people that work on these cool projects um, that we know about, really. I think those are cool and I, I thank uh, them all for doing that. Um, but if you know what I'm talking about, if this has happened to you, 
you know this is true, and, and at some point in your life, uh, you either hit it or you will hit it. So just keep in, keep in mind that caring about the things that you do is more important than actually trying to be cool. <laughs> you guys got to stop this shit, really. <laughs> so speaking about uh, not doing things that, uh, just to make us look cool, um, one of the things that uh, happens very often nowadays, now that we have internet and social media, is that people talk about shit that they don't know. And uh, they pretend that they care because they want to look cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of people talking on Twitter about diversity. And few of them actually know what diversity is. Uh, there's a ton of people talking about inclusivity, and very few of them actually know what inclusivity is. So if you don't know something, just research, right? That's good. Google, Google it, learn about it, and then talk about it. Or just shut the fuck up. It's, it's easy, right? So the Italian meatball sauce, it doesn't exist. I mean, it ex you want to sell it? It's fine. Just call it meatball sauce. It is not Italian. It is not traditional Italian sauce. So. <laughs> Google it out, and you'll find it. Um, don't talk about the things that you don't know. Like, care about the things that you want to talk about. Care about the things that you want to work on. Um, so, again, if you don't know something, but you think the topic is interesting, like the example of diversity and inclusivity, Google it. Talk to people that actually have problems with this. Talk to people that have actually do, done research on it and learn something about it, and then go ahead and talk about it. Otherwise, just don't. And, and choose your fights. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta know what kind of fights you wanna fight on. You, don't, you can't, again, overwhelm is the motivating. You cannot be part of every conversation that there is on Twitter. Um, no one can do that, not even Twitter. So, keep in mind that you should choose your fights. And now won't fight the Hawaiian pizza. Um, <clears throat> you wanna put pineapple on your pizza? Fine, you're fucking wrong. This is, you shouldn't be doing that. But that is your problem. I decide to be happy and right in silence, just to let you be happy and wrong. Um, enjoy your Hawaiian pizza, just don't call it Italian. Uh, no one has done that, but just in case. You never know. Um, so with time, I learned to not only pick my fights, um, Actually, let me put it this, uh, in a different way. There are many things that happen in the internet. There are many things that happen on Twitter. So among all those things, there are some fights that you feel like you will be willing to fight for, right? Some things, some um, topics and discussions that you say, I could just jump on this one. And because I know the topic, I care about it, and um, well, I have the time for it. Well, it turns out that among all of those things that you could jump on, um, you should also pick precisely the ones that you really, really, really want to jump on. So one of my previous bosses um, once told me that trying to find the words that he used. Um, anyway, we had a very good relationship. So he said something like, Flavio, you are a smart guy. Your problem is that you don't know when to shut the fuck up. And you want to jump on every fight, uh, you, don't, you, don't, you just don't let it go for some reason. And sometimes it is good. Sometimes it is good. You don't, you don't have time for every fight. And there are some fights that you want to um, you know, go and fight for. So there are some others that you just have to skip them. And, and again, like I learned this the hard way. And um, by, you know, I, I work on OpenStack. And this, that is my dark secret. No, it's not really dark. I actually like it. But uh, I work on OpenStack. OpenStack is a, it's got a massive community behind it. And there are so many different fights that we can fight. And in the community, there are not only developers. There are also vendors. There are also other companies. Some of the companies, uh, from a market perspective, they are also competitors of us. But in the community, we are all friends. And we try to uh, keep it that way as much as possible. But when it comes to actually doing business, outside of the community, well, you know, that's when I get really uh, dangerous, probably. Um, and yeah, I, I, I like to jump on every fight, and I jumped once in one that I shouldn't be jumping on, 
and that ended up really bad for me and my boss. So is I, <laughs> is, uh, I learned it the hard way. So there, there might be many fights that are worth for you fighting, but among those, you have to pick the ones that you really want to spend your time on. Not all of them are actually um, worth it. Um, switching topics a little bit, um, as I was as I was trying to learn and learn more about the things, and 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 I figured out that dopamine was a thing. I also learned that um, growth is a reward, and I was I was trying to change my perspective on the things that I was working on. I said, okay, so I'm gonna start working on projects. And I don't want to do it for fame. I don't want to. I, I really want to care about things. But where am I gonna get my dopamine hits from? Because I like it. And you know, what's up, what, what am I gonna get out of these projects? How am I gonna learn and and grow? And you know, make sure that I have like a future and a good career ahead. So I also figured out that growth is actually a reward. Every time I feel like I'm growing, and I'm not talking about the promotions that you get at work. That's cool, sure, and we should all do that. Um, but even growing in a very silent way, every time you learn something from a new project that is rewarding, there's a dopamine hit behind that. Every time you manage to do something on your own and you figure out like a bug, and then you reward yourself, there is a dopamine hit there. So every time I felt like I was growing and I was learning something new, that was enough for me. And, and the reward that I got from that, that was enough for me to actually just keep doing whatever I was doing and to keep myself motivated on the stuff that I was working on. And that taught me that you own your own, your own growth. And you might know this, but if you don't, this is important. You are, you are in control of your own growth. And I know there are different situations for different people and not all will not uh, we all not get the same opportunities, but I used to have a lot of self self pity. So it turns out I'm not only Italian; I'm half Venezuelan actually. So if you know anything about South America or Venezuela, you know the Venezuela went from being the richest country in South America to being the poorest country in South America in like few years, really not much, considering a country like around 20. But whatever. The thing is that when I when I started um, when I started uh, coding and, and learning new things, I, I kept repeating myself. You know, um, I don't have the same opportunities that other people have because we have a different situation here. Like we gotta worry about food, we gotta worry about other things. You know, we gotta worry about people being killed on the streets and all that kind of things. Um, it's not like I can just go and go to a conference because I don't really have the money for that. And I kept just like having self-pity for myself. And that was my excuse for not uh, actually pushing myself to doing something else. And I moved to Italy and where I live now. And, and I kept doing it. I was like, well, you know, I wish I would be as smart as this guy, but I'm not because, you know, it turns out I didn't go to college because I didn't have the same opportunities and blah, 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 blah. And like five years went by and I was already in Italy for five years and I was like, you know, like this is this is not good. Like I've been out of, you know, Venezuela where which was like the thing stopping me, um, air quotes. And I cannot be keep using that as an excuse to not do the things that I really want to do and push myself to do something else. So let me put it this way. This is like hearing a forty years old person saying that he or she is orphan. You're forty years old. Like orphans are kids. You're 40 years old, just like go the, fro the, the fuck up. Like you should be moving on. You're not an orphan, you're an adult. Get your shit together and go to work. Learn new things, move on. And I don't mean to offend anyone uh, who's lost a parent or something, but if you are a grown up, you're not an orphan. You can even Google it, it is on Wikipedia. I Google it before coming here. I just wanna make sure. Um, so, you're not an orphan anymore. It's the same thing. It's like I was out of there. I was, I was, I could not keep using this as an excuse for me to not grow up and not do other things and push myself. So um, the thing I did is that I, I found myself a, a new job. So I'm not saying that you should do that, but that worked for me. I just pushed myself and, and I learned that trying is free. So I tried and I tried and I tried. 
and I tried with Google and failed, remember? Big O. Um, that was embarrassing, really embarrassing. But I learned a lot. Uh, so I kept trying until I found a, a, a new job that I, that I like. So I've been there for five years-ish. Yes, five years in January, actually, um, at Red Hat. And trying is free. And I mean this in, like, in every sense possible. Uh, you, you can try to get a new job if you want. You can try to get that promotion that you want. You can try to get that um, uh, salary increase that you want. You can, you can try to get on that new project. Like, just like there are hard things um, out there, but if you don't try them, you'll never know if you actually, you know, what things you need to learn and how hard you have to push yourself. Like, I had no idea how to how compilers worked until I started working on the Rustlang compiler. Um, that was one of the other things that I jumped on, but then dropped. But anyway, like I started, I, I worked on it, and I worked on it like for two years, and I learned a lot. I, I now know how a compiler works, and I, I, I was one of the contributors uh, for, for Rustlang. So had I not tried, I would never uh, you know, learned how hard it is to build a compiler, and I would never know how the compiler works. So trying is free. The worst that can happen, well, you fail, then you stand up again, and then you try again. And uh, that's uh, basically a uh, circle of life. Find mentors. Um, again, I figured out how to use Google. Why would I ever need anyone to teach me anything? Uh, I, I, I've got Uncle Google that will teach me everything I need to know. Until um, I, well, again, Google um, interview, big O notation, big embarrassment, and I learned that I probably needed someone that would teach me something. So I found myself mentors, not one, but many. You learn different things from different people. And you don't really need to go and tell them, hey, you are my mentor, please hold my hand, take me. Um, I really need you. Uh, you can do that, that is awesome. If, if you have someone that you look up to, um, Grant that person some dopamine hits from time to time, <laughs> and 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 tell them that you really look up to them. And one of the persons that I used to look up to, actually, I still look up to the uh, to this person. Uh, he's my boss now. And um, and a couple of years ago, I almost actually um, wanted to change some of the things um, in my life. So I talked to him, and then we shuffled things around. Now he's my boss, um, and and we talked a lot. So I learned a lot from him. But there are some other mentors that I have in my life that I don't really go and tell them, hey, you know what, you're my mentor, I follow everything that you do. I just look at them, learn from them, and then move on. Uh, eventually I'll change mentors, and I'll sometimes go back to the same person. But it's, the important thing here is that you should always have a mentor in every stage of your life. You, there's always something that you need to learn, and there's always someone that can teach that to you. Uh, and 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 I know it is hard to believe, but Google doesn't have all the answers. And that taught me that I should compete with myself and, and collaborate with others. So again, I started coding online, and, and I said, well, if I want to be someone, I've got to beat all these guys. So I just started, again, coding, coding, coding. I want to be awesome. You know, I want people to know me, and I'm going to compete with everyone out there. That is exhausting. Uh, and impossible, so, um, and very arrogant, actually, uh, admittedly. Um, so, what I learned is that I should be competing with myself. I learned how to compete with my fears, um, and then I started trying new things. I learned to, com I learned to compete uh, against my own ignorance, and so I could be humble enough to actually learn something else from other people and listen what other people had to say. Um, I learned to compete against my impatience because I wanted everything to happen now. You know, I started contributing to, I don't know, whatever project, Rustlang, I wanted to be core. Give me access. I'm, I'm a smart guy. I'm not going to fuck it up, um, except that I did. So, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, I learned how to compete with my, my low self-esteem, and I learned how to compete against my uh, self-pity. So. If there's someone in this world that you should be competing against, it is yourself. It is your own fears. It is the things that hold you back. So instead of spending so much time trying to compete and be the best out there on Twitter, spend some extra time trying to be a better person. Compete against yourself and try to collaborate with other people out there. Because the moment you start collaborating with other people, you start learning more from them. 
and that makes you a better person. That helps you grow. And when you grow, what, what's, what's growth? It is a reward. And after that, gets what? Dopamine hits. It's awesome. Um, so collaborating offline is also important. And when I, see, when, I, when I say collaboration, I not only mean um, like Twitter or open source projects, I also mean your coworkers or people around you. Uh, turns out that you know, there's, there's a lot you can learn from them. And the only thing that you can do that is by talking to them and collaborating. So I also learned that boredom is, uh, it may be a sign. It may be a sign that um, something is off in your life and that uh, you, you might need a change. So again, I'm a millennial. I get bored really quick. Uh, and I don't want to use that as an excuse. I just, I, I just know it happens. And as a kid, I had everything, really. Like I wanted a Game Boy. Yes, Game Boy. Uh, I got a Game Boy. Uh, I had mountains in the back of my house. I had really, really nice neighbors that I could play with. I had everything. And yet, every weekend, I would go to my dad and say, like, I'm bored. I don't know what to do. And my dad was, like, pulling his hair off. He was like, how is it possible? Like, you've got everything. You cannot be bored. Like, what else should I do? And when I learned this, I actually thought that it was, you know, that thing that I have where I just get bored very easily and I always need to change and I don't, I'm never satisfied with the stuff that I'm doing. But it turns out that if you look deep, uh, sometimes the boredom is actually a sign that you might want to change the topics or change the projects that you're working on. So after spending some time in, in some of the projects, I would get bored of the other project and I would uh, sit down for a second and analyze whether um, the thing that I was actually getting bored about was the project itself, or was the community, or was the task, or the specific task that I was working on? So if it is the task, it is easy, change task, get another one, move on. But if it is a project, then there's a sign that you might need a change in your life. You might need a new project to work on, and it is totally fine. You should be working on the things that you really care about. If the project is not something that you care about, if that specific project, that specific company, person, whatever, is not something that you care about anymore, it is totally fine to just move on. Just do it. Things must feel right. And that is, um, I, I tend to rationalize everything. And, and in everything I do and everything, uh, so my sister calls me Flackipedia. Because, not because I know how to Google things and I know what Wikipedia is. It's because I, I rationalize everything she says. And, and when she says something that is off, I'll just go and try to correct her and say like, well, it turns out that things are not exactly the way that you think they are. Uh, there's the other side, and if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, but, but things must feel right, right? Not everything is rational. And I learned these by uh, when, you know, in all these years that, is, that is, I have spent on OpenStack, where you're trying to organize a community of developers that is massive. There are thousands and thousands of developers in the open source community from different cultures, different time zones. And there are some things that are rationally correct. And you would say, well, you know, like one plus one, that's two. There's nothing to discuss there. But it turns out that if you look at it from the other side, it doesn't, it's, it, you know, the perspective is different. Uh, it doesn't have the same meaning for other people and people don't feel right about it. So sometimes it is better for things to feel right and not be completely rational than fighting for the things that are uh, entirely rational and then having people not feeling comfortable with uh, the environment. So what you really want to work for is that you want to build around you an environment where you feel safe and where you feel comfortable, comfortable in. You don't want to build an environment where everything is rational and you give zero fucks about the people that are around you. Um, fun fact, on Sunday, um, well, here's the thing. Um, you, you gotta, sometimes you gotta, you gotta um, trust Mr. God. I, I don't know what the God is, but uh, people keep saying that you should trust your God and listen to your God and do whatever your God says. Uh, sometimes it is good to trust it. Um, 
on Sunday, my gut said that I shouldn't go surfing, and I went and I broke my surfboard, and that is terrible. I'm an idiot, but I did it. And, um, but it is not broken in half, in case that's why you're picturing. Um, it's just a thin hook. But it was really sad. I didn't trust my gut, and I went anyway. So having self-confidence is um, it's really important. It's not the same as being an arrogant. And so I went, I went from having um, an extreme amount of self-confidence at the beginning of my career to having uh, zero confidence. Because when, um, when I was slapped in the face with a big O question and a whole bunch of other things that happened in between, um, ton, you know, tons of shit happened in between. And I went from, you know, did some introspection, thought about it a little bit longer, and said, well, you know, Flavio, you, you probably shouldn't be such an arrogant asshole. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> uh, you shouldn't be such an arrogant. And, and uh, you know, like, you're probably taking it a step, a step too uh, far. And I went from being uh, very arrogant with um, some people and with myself to not having basically enough self-confidence, where I would think that everyone would know more than me and that I would normally never ever know anything. So, self-confidence is not the same thing as arrogance. I trust my ability to um, complete the things that I want to work on. I trust my ability to learn, and I trust my ability to adapt and, and be an engineer. I now know that I don't know everything, and that there are many things in life that um, if you listen, you'll learn them, if you dedicate enough time to them, you'll learn more, and that will build up your self-confidence a little bit more, and that will make you a better person. So what I, what I changed actually is that I stopped having so much confidence in the things I know, and I started having more confidence in the things that I'm able to do and I'm capable of. So I know what I'm capable of, I know I don't know anything, um, or many things, or everything, but I know that I can learn them, given enough time and, and dedication. So, if you if you are an arrogant, stop it. I hate arrogance. Um, don't do it for me. Do it for yourself. Have some self confidence, which is different. And and that taught me that you learn something from from everything you do. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one, but. Again, it doesn't matter if it is a good thing or a bad thing. There is something to learn on, on everything that you do. And honest uh, self-evaluation is really important. And this is something that I've always done, really. It's not like it magically hit me and I figured out that I should evaluate myself more often. This is actually I've always done. Even as a kid, I would always like try to, th try to think about the things that I was doing wrong and see how I could improve them. And if you don't have, like, and I still do this, actually. Every year or every six months, uh, sometimes, I'll come up with a Google form with two questions. It's like, tell me everything that you hate about working with me, and tell me everything that you love about working with me. That's it. Anonymous form sent to the people that I've been spending uh, time with in, in, the, in the last period, and just let them fill them in. You gotta know something, you gotta be ready because some people are very honest. <laughs> uh, and, um, but it is, if, if you don't, if you don't talk on, on, on the details, on the, on the harsh um, size of, of the feedback that you get and you just read in between lines, because that's, that's basically all you gotta do, um, you'll find many things that you can improve. And, and the reason you gotta read between lines is because forms and that kind of things, those are very rational mediums of communication. Like you have two fields, you ask me two questions, and I'm just gonna answer with whatever I have in mind, right? It's not, there's no emotion behind it. And the important thing is though, that you, if you dedicate some time to have honest self-evaluation, I'm, I'm not saying that you should just all go and create a Google form now and send to everyone uh, and send it to everyone in this conference and get feedback from. But even even if you do it with yourself, um, you can you can get a lot out of it. I do it. I like it. I would advise you to do it. It's worked fantastic for me.
And again, talking about the rational tools, I learned that doing these feedbacks and self-evaluations, I also learned that uh, giving emotional answers is sometimes um, important. So um, I've, I've often gotten emails of people asking for feedback on their performance and, and the stuff they're doing, even if it is just software. Also, I hate this thing where people say that you're not the code you write, you're you are your fucking code, like you wrote it, like you spent some time on it. It's like, stop that bullshit, really. Uh, because if, if, if I installed your code, you'll be offended. So you are you're your freaking code. Um, and yeah. I try not to get offended, you know, like we all have something to learn, but you are your freaking code. Uh, but you got you gotta give emotional answers when needed. So I get people asking for feedback on the things that they're working on, either it is code or just like career paths and the kind of things. You, these are the kind of things that you don't want to reply over email. Like you wanna just get the phone if you have the number of that person, just do a video call. There are a gazillion of softwares nowadays and services that you can use to have a video call or a phone call. And just provide the feedback there because that is an emotional question when someone tells you, tell me how good I'm doing or tell me how bad I'm doing. That is a, there's emotion behind that. And you don't want to provide a rational answer to them because that is, um, even if they don't know it, that is kind of like unfair and very cold. And the message that you want to send through, it's not going to go through. So. If they need the email co like confirmation, it's fine. Just like call them, give them the feedback, and then as I told you on the phone, this is what I think. And that's it. They have the confirmation. But at least you took the time to get on the phone and, and talk to that person. Um, so, and that, that brought me to uh, dedicating enough time to meaningful relations, uh, relationships. And in every conference I go, I always try to at least build one meaningful relationship. I don't try to meet everyone. I would love to, but I don't try to do that. I try to at least leave the conference uh, knowing that at least I know one of uh, the attendees well enough to know what they're working on, uh, the things that they're motivated about. And if I get to know one of their hobbies, that's awesome. Otherwise, cool. At least I know if I see that person, I'll, I'll remember um, the person and I'll remember the things that they're working on and I have something to, to ask about. So it's not a matter of talking to many people, but rather talking to someone and actually dedicating the time is about caring about the people. So I learned how to dedicate some extra time to meaningful relationships and that taught me that my culture is actually an asset that I have. And this is true for each and every one of you. Each and every one of you have your own culture. Mine is half Italian and half Venezuelan. I take the most out of it as much as I can. It is as much as I would like it to be, it is not perfect. And, <laughs> and, and, and there's a lot that we can, we can share um, you know, off of cultures. So your culture is actually your asset, use it. Because the way that you approach problems is not the same way that I approach problems. If you teach me your way to approach problems, we can uh, decide which method is better in each of the situations that we're on and we can get better results. And that is just one of the examples of the power, the power that there is behind cultures and the, the many things that you can do with it. Um, the, I actually have an entire talk on this topic actually, but and in a nutshell, as um, one, of, one of my managers, I've had many managers. Uh, so one of my managers once told me, like she, we were on the phone and she told me, um, among all the qualities that you have, Flavio, your passion and the passion that you dedicate and you put on the things that you work on is the one that I like the most. Don't change that. And I started thinking, you know, like, you're talking about passion. Like, you know, I've, been sp I, I've spent like three years in, you know, whatever we're doing. And yes, I put a lot of passion on the stuff that I'm doing. But what is this passion actually doing for me? You know, what am I getting out of it? Like, I'm putting everything that I have on every single, single thing that I'm working on. But I'm not getting, I don't feel like I'm right now, I'm getting enough out of it. And the reason is that I was, I was just spreading myself too large and I was trying to do way more things that I should be doing. And that basically killed my motivation for that specific project and I had to move on. But the thing is that your passion is awesome and you should put 100% of yourself on everything that you do. 
but don't let your passion for coding make you sign up for every project that you find on the internet because I did that and, and that's going to kill you. When you have too many things to do, as I said before, uh, you overcommit and then you underdeliver, and that is very demotivating. And so the thing is that it is not really about rushing because you don't have enough time to do things, right? It's not like your clock is ticking and, and something could happen at the end of this conference and you won't be able to do the things that you want to do. It's not about rushing because you don't have enough time. It is about doing the best that you can with the time that you have. So it's a very different thing. You know that you have a limited amount of time that you can dedicate on specific projects and the stuff that you're working on. Given that information, you have the power to dedicate as much time as you can, and you can dedicate as much focus as you can on the projects that you're working on. So don't try to rush it because you want to do more, and probably just do less and do better with the time that you have available. Which basically translates to don't always say yes. Especially if you work on an open source project. It's very, very common when you start working on open source projects. It's like, why not do this? Yeah, sure, why not? Why don't we add this feature? Yeah, sure, why not? Why don't you? Yeah, sure, why not? It would be cool to have this. Sure. You know? And then you find yourself with a whole bunch of things to do and no one actually contributing to it. And so don't say yes all the time. Just like do the best that you can with the time that you have available. And let people know that you don't have time. It's fine. Like it's, it's cool to say, I would love to help you. I just don't have enough time. I might have time in a month from now. I don't have it right now. You want it right now? Find someone that will help you. Um, and well, don't overcommit. I've said this a couple of times throughout the uh, talk because it's a very important uh, topic. In every scenario, actually, you, it doesn't matter if you're a community manager, if it doesn't matter if you're trying to build a community, if you're trying to build your own career, don't overcommit. Don't overcommit with your family, don't overcommit with your, uh, um, in your career, don't overcommit at work. It is sometimes better to have some extra time in your hands on trying to you know, have some spare time and don't overcommit on things and just overcommitting and under delivering because not only that is demotivating but also that leaves a very bad impression of yourself and you don't want that and i really appreciate when people tell me hey i would like you know i i hear what you're saying i would like to work on this but i already have enough on my plate i i really really respect that i respect that because i know that you're not trying to get something just for the sake of doing something else. And, and if I ever ask you to do something, you'll make sure that you can dedicate enough time and enough focus and, 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 and energy to it just to do a good job. So wrapping up, time is your most valuable currency. Remember that. Don't work for fame. Again, don't work for fame. Once more, don't work for fame. Uh, you own your own growth. This is, this, is my, this is my motto. It has been my motto in the last, I don't know, year probably. Um, and I keep repeating this to myself. I keep repeating this to the people I, I work with and the people that I mentor uh, because I, I, I truly believe that you are uh, in control of your own growth. So you want to you wanna get an increase on your salary, go and talk to your boss. If you don't do it, you're not going to get it. You want to get a promotion, go and talk to your boss. If you don't do it, you're not going to get it. It would be awesome if your boss would magically come to you and say, like, hey, I'm just going to give you 100 grand more, but that's not going to happen. Um, so, and I don't want to get into the discussion on whether, you know, the boss and, and employee relationship kind of things. Like, sure, we all not have the same bosses. We all not live in, in, in this magical, like, rainbow full of unicorns. But if you take control of your own growth, you'll soon realize that if your boss is not right for you, it is better for you to just change jobs. That is one option. Or change bosses. That is also an option. Find mentors, not one, not two. Find many of them. Uh, there's something to learn from um, each and one of them. And your culture is your asset. So really wrapping up now, unplug. Unplug for the things that you're doing. If you... It's, it's good to be passionate about the things that you do, but if, if you cannot unplug from your work and you cannot unplug from your um, project, your open source project, 
you are probably being too dependent on it and and you're not you're not building something that can survive after you which is probably not really good and so i learned that it is it is it's good to to unplug from from tech and from work and i'm not talking about getting holidays going on holidays or, or traveling and some things such. i'm actually talking about just unplugging really for a while just just don't show up to conferences anymore i've done that and it's really relieving and and you you get a boost of energy for the year after and it turns out people don't forget you uh, if that's that's what you're really scared about people don't forget you um and well i mean i guess it's harder for me because i'm italian and very loud but um, but people won't forget you. It's, it's just do it. It's actually very healthy and it l will give you a lot of time to reflect and, and, and see the things that you want to work on and, and improve. And finally, I learned that tech is not really my life. I love tech. I'm not going to go and say like, you know, I wish I could do something else. No, I actually love tech. Uh, I want to stay here. This is something I love doing. I love spending time on, but this is not my life. It's not what defines me. Uh, Twitter is not is not what uh, says who Flavio is, and I I really hope that this is something that you can do as well, and find new find new hobbies. Like I don't care if, um, you know, like Twitterland or again people at conferences forget about me. And I don't mean this in an arrogant way. I actually I actually care a lot about you know the people I know at conferences and and the different communities that I'm a part of. But I've learned that dedicating. 20 hours per day to tech and four hours sleeping and eating is not really healthy. And, and that there's more to life than just technology and internet. So I started doing other stuff. I'm not gonna bore you with all the hobbies that I have, but it is important to learn that there's, there's way more behind tech. So, and the time that you spend outside tech is actually going to make you a better uh, tech person because you're gonna learn things from other things and from other environments, from other hobbies, and you're going to bring that into the tech culture, and and that's hopefully going to make the tech industry better, and it'll it'll give you more energy, and it'll provide you more uh, a refresh or change of point of views. Thank you. <laughs>